Some of you may wonder why I'm sitting down. I'm not sick, but I'm getting older. I'm 75 now and I can still stand for one or two hours a day, but when it comes to four or five hours, it's a little more difficult. And so like I've always done all through my life, whenever I venture into something new like this, I try to see how did Jesus do it. And I was quite surprised after studying the Bible for 55 years, I discovered something in the last few months that I'd never seen before. That Jesus always sat down when he taught. Did you know that? <laughs> I was absolutely surprised to find that. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, when he spoke in the synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, he was standing up. In John chapter 7, when he said, if any man thirst come to me, he stood up. Those are the two places where he stood up, but he was proclaiming something to unbelievers. But I was so surprised to read. And just for your information, I'll show it to you. In Matthew 26, in verse 55, he told the people who came to capture him in Gethsemane, every day, the last part of verse 55, I used to sit in the temple teaching. He used to sit every single day. And he was only 30. <laughs> <laughs> he used to sit and teach every single day the Sermon on the Mount which we all know Matthew 5 verse 1 and 2 his disciples came to him he sat down and opened his mouth and taught and Luke chapter 5 once he got into a boat and it says he, when he got into the boat um, Luke 5 verse 3 the last part, he sat down and taught the multitudes. He sat and taught. He stood and proclaimed, but he sat and taught. John chapter 8 and verse 2. He came to the temple and he sat and taught. Now why am I saying that? <clears throat> uh, there's nothing special about standing or sitting, but... I feel that Jesus, when he was proclaiming to unbelievers, he was proclaiming a, a message, inviting them to come, if anyone thirst, come to me, etc. But when he was teaching, he was building a family. And like when we sit around at the dining table with our children, we don't stand. We sit and talk. And so I'm, the emphasis I have here is not the matter of sitting as much as the spirit of a family when we come together as God's people. A church is meant to be a family. And here, I would presume that more than 90% of you know Jesus as your savior, or probably 95 or 98%. And so, those in some areas, we may have a few different convictions. We are one family in Christ. Don't ever forget that. And when we sit together, it's as a family. Like in our own home, our children are different. So in Christ's family also, there are differences. But we are one family. So our subject is living a life that pleases God. And that's <clears throat> something which I want to share. And maybe I can begin with Second Corinthians in chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. You know, Paul speaks of an ambition that he had. Second Corinthians 5, he says, verse 9, Therefore also we have as our ambition. Young people have an ambition. It's good to have ambition. The trouble is a lot of people have got the wrong ambition. Here was Paul's ambition, which all of us should have. We have as our ambition... Whether at home, and if you see the context of it, he's talking about heaven as our home. Or on earth absent from home. So he's saying, whether I'm at home in heaven, which will happen one day, or right now absent from home, I have one ambition. I want to please God. 
And Paul once said, follow me as I follow Christ. He was following Jesus who also had one ambition, to please his father. I'm not ashamed to say that I follow Paul because he followed Christ. I'm not ashamed to say that I follow a godly man who I see following Christ. It helps me. And the Holy Spirit has said specifically in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul says, follow me. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, we thank God for godly people. I thank God for the few godly men I met in my life whom I could follow. Not just whom I could hear from, but whom I could follow. And Paul says, here's one area I like to follow Paul. He had an ambition, whether at home, in heaven, or here on earth, to please God. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? Think for a moment. If Christ were to come, and we all went to heaven, I want to ask you, just think for a moment. You, you got to heaven now. What will be your ambition in heaven? Think of it. When you get to heaven, what will be your ambition? Will it be to make money? Will it be to impress one of the angels? Will it be to show off and see how, show other people how smart you are? All of that will disappear. In heaven, everybody's got one ambition. That's to please God. Christ is the center. And they want to please him. And we'll fall in line. So what Paul is saying is, that's going to be the direction I'm going to live all eternity. That's going to be the direction I'm going to be moving in all eternity to please God, to please Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is, I'm aligning myself with that now on earth so that if I suddenly transition from earth to heaven, either by death or by the rapture, there won't be any change in my direction. Will there be a change in your direction? Supposing you transition from earth to heaven tonight through death. Would there be a change in your direction? Would you, would you say, oh, I spent all my life living for money now. Now I've got to change. I've got to start pleasing God. Or I was living all my life trying to show how people what a wonderful person I was. Now I've got to get rid of all that. It's a very searching question. Is there going to be a change in the direction in which you're living your life right now? If you're a serious Christian, I want you to think about that. I spent, I left the Navy 55 years ago to serve the Lord. And for the first nine years, I traveled all over India, when I say literally all over India, from north to south, east to west, looking at the different churches. And I came back to my home pretty fed up with what I saw. I said, Lord, most people just seem to want to go to heaven. That's about all. Somehow, make sure I go to heaven when I die. But look at the way they are living on earth. What a disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ. And yet the Lord taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The number one request in the heart of a godly man is that God's name should be hallowed. And it was not being hallowed by the way Christians were living in India. And so at the end of nine years, I quit all that traveling and I said, Lord, I want to in a very little way, even if it is only a drop in an ocean, I want to try and gather a few people together whose ambition will be to please you. And I don't want to gather together people who want to go to heaven. No, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to go around getting people ready to go to heaven. I want to gather people who want to follow Jesus Christ on earth before going to heaven. And that number is much less, much lesser. There are multitudes who want to go to heaven. But among them, how many want to follow Jesus Christ on earth, taking up the cross every day, denying themselves, seeking to please God, 
before going to heaven. Those are the really sincere, wholehearted Christians. The rest are a bunch of selfish people who want to live for themselves, enjoy all that they can on earth, but make sure I go to heaven when I die. It's like I remember hearing a story of a Sunday school class that was taught the story of Lazarus and the rich man, you know, the rich man who died and went to hell and Lazarus the poor beggar who died and went to heaven. And then the Sunday school teacher asked the children, okay children, who do you want to be like? And one smart boy got up and said, I want to be like the rich man on earth and like Lazarus after I die. <laughs> but don't you think most Christians are like that? And perhaps you're like that too, even though you don't say it. I want to be like the rich man here on earth. And I want to be like Lazarus after I die. Can you think of anything more selfish? Can you think of anything which is more selfish and self-centered than that when you think of the sacrifice that Jesus made to save us from sin? We should be hanging our head in shame. And if you don't do it here, I want to tell you, you will do it when you see the Lord face to face. When you see how much he loved you, how much he sacrificed and gave himself for you, and you see the selfish way you live, not to please him, enjoy yourself and satisfy your lusts, and oh, I got to heaven finally. I would, I'd be ashamed to get to heaven like that, I'll tell you honestly, I would be. And I won't get a second chance to show my love for Jesus Christ by sacrifice. In heaven I'll get plenty of opportunity to show my love for Christ with praise and worship and thanksgiving and all the wonderful things we can do in heaven. But there's one thing I will not be able to do in heaven. I will not be able to show my love for Christ by sacrificing and denying myself because there'll be nothing to deny myself in heaven. There'll be nothing to sacrifice in heaven. And I want to say to you that if you have missed the opportunity to take up the cross and deny yourself here on earth, you have missed it for eternity. And you live with a regret about that for all eternity. We tell unbelievers there's no second chance to be saved. It's here on earth or never. And I say to believers there's no second chance to take up the cross and deny yourself and follow Jesus. It's either now or Never. And as much as that unbeliever will regret that he didn't accept Christ here on earth, the believer is going to regret that he didn't take up the cross here on earth. That's the type of church I want to build. I'm not interested in building any other type of church because that's the only type of church that Jesus came here to build. That's why he, what he died for. He never told his disciples to gather people who want to go to heaven. He said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And he said, go into the world and make disciples. That means people who want to follow me. That's our calling. Why don't people do that? Because you won't get many numbers. No, you won't. But you'll get quality. You'll get a church that Jesus can proudly point out to the devil. You know, in Job's day when the devil could point out so many hypocrites on earth to God, God could say, yes, it's true, Satan, but have you seen Job? He's different. And today when the devil can point out so many hypocritical churches and multitudes of Christians who want to just go to heaven, and the devil says, look at these people who call themselves Christians. God, they only want to go to heaven. They're not interested in you then God should be able to say, yes, but look at this church. There are not many there, but look at that. Look at those people. They are not like that, Satan. They are a credit to my name. I hope you have a burden to be a part of a church like that. I hope you have a burden. If you have any type of ministry to build a church like that, that's the only thing I want to spend my life. I've spent 40 years doing that in India mostly and I have no regret as I look back a life that pleases God this is our ambition that I will not change my direction if I'm suddenly 
transition from earth to heaven. There will be zero, not even a one degree change in my direction. It will be 100% to please God from morning till night to the best of my ability. The only thing is here on earth because of the weakness of the flesh we may accidentally slip up and get up again. That won't happen in heaven. But as far as my will is concerned, it's set. Only to please God. I hope that will be true of you. And if it is not my brother, sister, I hope it will be true of you before this weekend is over. That is what Jesus lived on earth for. You know, in God's desire to lead man out of the sin into which Adam led the human race, in, um, he did it in two stages. The first stage was what we call the Old Covenant, not Old Testament. The Covenant and Testament mean the same, but unfortunately we call the 39 books of the Bible Old Testament. And the Bible doesn't call it that, people have called it that. I would call it, prefer to call it books written before Christ came and 27 books written after Christ came because we confuse. The Old Testament, 39 books are not abolished, not at all. They are very much the Bible. We must read it, I read it, I study it, I learn a lot from it about God. But the Old Covenant has been abolished. That is the covenant that God made with Israel on Sinai, which is known as the law, that's been abolished. You read that in Hebrews chapter 8. There are two verses in Hebrews 8 which are very important for us to understand. I've come to see that the fundamental problem with many, many, many Christians is that they have not understood clearly the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. They don't know that the Old Covenant has been abolished. It's, uh, and people want to live under the Old Covenant. I wonder why. India became independent from the British in 1947. All of you in America became independent from the British in 1776. Do you want to go back under that rule again? We don't want to go back under that rule in India. Why do Christians go back to the old covenant which was abolished 2000 years ago? I can't understand. God's abolished it. Hebrews 8 verse 7, that first covenant was faulty and therefore there was a need for a second one. What does it mean when God established a covenant that was faulty? If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant. Is it like some car manufacturer that makes a car and discovers there's some fault in it and rectifies it in the new model? Not at all. What it means is that God never intended the first covenant to do all that God wanted to accomplish in man. It was not possible. So God had to do it in two stages. In that sense it was faulty. Not that God made a mistake, he never makes a mistake. But he had to do it in two stages and therefore there was a second covenant and he, he finds fault with that first covenant and says, I'm going to make a new covenant now. And now, see this, it will not be laws written outside on tablets of stone or in a book. Verse 10, I will put my law into their mind, the middle of verse 10. I will write it in their hearts. That was not possible under the old covenant. So the first step was, that God's laws will be written on tablets of stone. And to have it written in the Bible is not much different from having it written on tablets of stone. It is outside of us. But in the new covenant he said, I will write it inside of us. And when he wrote it on tablets of stone and gave it to Moses, he was thereby implying, man's heart is harder than this rock on which I write my laws. I cannot write it on man's heart. That was the meaning of writing it on stone. It's easier for me to write on rock than to write it in your hearts. Your hearts are so hard. You remember when the disciples, oh, sorry, the Pharisees, you read in Matthew 19, came to Jesus and said, why did Moses permit divorce when you say divorce is not right? He said, Moses permitted it because your hearts were 
hard. He said that. Harder than the rock. But Jesus said it was not like that from the beginning. God hates divorce. You read that in Malachi 2.16. Why did he permit it? Because man's hearts were hard. There are many things God permitted in the old covenant because man's heart was hard. Jesus said that in Matthew 19. So when people go to the old covenant and find an excuse for something they do, I say, are you going back? Do you want to go back to the stone age when there was no electricity, no cars? We don't want to go back in the material realm to the old, olden days. Why do we want to go back spiritually to those days? The next verse, verse 13. When he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete it's obsolete. God's no longer dealing with people under the old covenant. But whatever is obsolete is growing old, is ready to disappear. Those early Jews who were converted were trying to figure out the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. It was in their mind, it was slowly disappearing. But as far as we are concerned, it's gone completely. It's disappeared completely. It's not there. We are in the new covenant. What is the essential difference? It was the, God's law was on the outside on a tablet of stone. Now it is inside. So in the old covenant you came to an external good life. In the new covenant you come to an inward good life. That is the essential difference between the old covenant and new covenant. And in the old covenant, no one could please God fully. There was a limit. The external life was less than 10% of man's life. Uh, what we could call it today, our conscious and our unconscious. And this is what Jesus tried to point out in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 5, Remember how Matthew 5 begins. He saw the multitudes, verse 1, but he sat down and taught his disciples. The multitudes were there, but he called his disciples and said, he says, I'm telling you this. This is not telling the multitudes how to be saved. No. Salvation is by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ that he died for your sins. That is salvation from the penalty of sin. But salvation has got three tenses, like in grammar, past, present, future. The past is the penalty of sin. Salvation in the present is from the power of sin day by day. And in the future is from the presence of sin when Christ comes again. So as far as salvation from the penalty of sin, that's not by keeping the Sermon on the Mount. You can't get one sin forgiven by keeping the Sermon on the Mount. That has to be purely and solely through the death of Christ on the cross. But having begun there, if you stop there, it's like Jesus said, a man who laid a foundation and never built anything else. That's the foundation. There's no doubt that's the foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3. But the tragedy is we have multitudes of people in this huge real estate lot Two or three houses and hundreds of thousands of foundations with no house. This is a picture of Christianity. Jesus said people will laugh at someone who's built a foundation and not built a house on it. My sins are forgiven. Yes, we agree that's the foundation, brother, but where's the house? And that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the building of the house. Matthew 5, he said in verse 20, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you believe that? Today when somebody says, how can I enter heaven? We tell him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll enter heaven. Supposing I tell him, your righteousness must be more than the righteousness of the Pharisees if you want to heaven, enter heaven. We say, where do you get that, that gospel from? Well, I got it from Matthew 5 verse 20. 
you can't be more spiritual than Jesus Christ do you believe what he said that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven immediately our mind begins to think in terms of quantity always the human mind thinks in terms of numbers and quantity quality comes way back in our thinking so when we read the word exceeds we may begin to think more than the Pharisees prayed three times a day I must pray five times a day the Pharisees fasted twice a week I must fast three times a week the Pharisees gave 10% I must give 15 or 20 percent we always think in terms of numbers it's not numbers it's quality the quality of my Christianity must be superior of my life must be superior to that of the Pharisees so let's look at the righteousness of the Pharisees and turn to Matthew chapter 23 Matthew 23 we read two things I always say there are two things that Jesus praised the Pharisees for many people think everything about the Pharisees was wrong no there were two things that were very good that Jesus himself appreciated number one Matthew 23 verse 2 and 3 the Pharisees have seated themselves on the chair of Moses everything that they tell you to do do so here's one good thing about the Pharisees their doctrines were absolutely right otherwise Jesus would never say everything they tell you to do do Jesus wouldn't tell us today everything the Jehovah's Witnesses tell you to do do everything the Mormons tell you to do do everything that the Roman Catholics tell you to do do he would never say that but he does say that about the Pharisees everything they tell you to do do just don't follow their lives because they don't practice what they preach so here's one good thing about the Pharisees correctness in doctrine secondly Matthew 23 and verse 25 you scribes and Pharisees you clean the outside of the cup your external life is good but inside is all dirty your inner life is corrupt but your external life is good now tell me is it a good thing for a man to have a good external life sure what's wrong with that that's better than the thieves and murderers and adulterers your external life is good so that's the second thing the Pharisees were commended for so what do we learn from that a man's doctrine can be 100% correct and his external life can be perfect and he can be the greatest Pharisee in town this is a description of most Christians who sit in different churches they can call themselves whatever they like Baptist Methodist Pentecostal their doctrine is right and their external life is right they are Pharisees there's something more that is needed your righteousness must be more than that more than correct doctrine more than a good external life you don't commit murder you don't commit adultery you don't steal you don't tell lies in court I can show you thousands of Hindus in India who live like that what is the difference between in fact the way I see some born-again Christians live there are non-Christians whose lives are better than this even their external life that's a tragedy and I believe God is calling his church back in these last days to an inner life of walk with God a life that pleases God and God is not pleased with just that external life He's not pleased with just correctness of doctrine. There's so much of argument in doctrine today. Are you a Calvinist? Are you an Armenian? Do you believe in the fundamental truths? Do you believe in the rapture before the tribulation or after the tribulation? I say, brother, whatever you may believe in, if you don't deny yourself and take up the cross, you can never follow Jesus. That's for sure. What are you glorying in these other things? what is the central thing people miss out the central thing and get taken up with all these peripheral things if you don't have the central thing right these peripheral things don't have value those peripheral things are important when you got the central thing right 
If your car's engine is not working, it's no use polishing the outside. Something like that. The thing's not moving, it's not working. It's good to keep the outside clean, but what about getting the car working? This is a picture of most Christians today. And I've been in almost every denomination in Christianity, I've seen them. And I don't know what it's like. So, when Jesus said in Matthew 5.20, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, he said, okay, now I will explain it to you. And that is the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. You have to see Matthew 5.20 as an introduction to whatever he said thereafter. He was leading people to that second stage from old covenant to new covenant. I told you God was leading man out of his sin in two stages, old covenant and new covenant. And here it is, Matthew 5, and the next verse, verse 21. The old covenant said, you shall not commit murder. I say to you, don't get angry. Because anger is the root from which murder comes. And the old covenant said, verse 27, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, you shouldn't lust in your heart after a woman. That's the root from which adultery springs. And so on through the Sermon on the Mount. The old covenant said in chapter 6, you must pray. But I say to you, make sure your motive is right when you pray. That you're not praying to impress people. But pray to God. Can you tell me how you pray when you pray in public? I'm sure a number of you have prayed in public. Compare your public prayers with the way you pray in private when you're all by yourself by your bedside. Is there a difference? When you're kneeling by your bed and there's nobody, not even your wife, you're just kneeling down and praying. How do you pray then? Then you're really praying to God. What about when you pray in public? Be honest. Compare the two. Do you find a difference? That you make the language more flowery and add a little emphasis in your voice here and there. What for? Are you trying to impress God? Or impress men? Do you see how Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, when you, verse 5 and 6 is very relevant even today? How you pray, how you give. In the Old Testament, the emphasis was give 10%. But the Lord says, Why are you giving? Are you trying to impress people? The Old Testament, there was teaching on fasting and it was quite okay if other people knew that you were fasting. It was well known in Israel the certain days they fasted and everybody knew that. But in the New Testament it says you shouldn't let people know that you're fasting. <clears throat> I know Christians who emphasize fasting. But I've also seen most of them boast about it as to how long they fasted in subtle ways. They disobey the one command that Jesus gave in relation to fasting. Jesus never told us to fast as a law. He always said, when you fast. He never said, you must fast. He said, when you fast, don't let people know about it. It's the inner life. It's the motive. So right through the Sermon on the Mount, he was talking about this inner life, which they could not have in the Old Covenant. Why couldn't they have it in the Old Covenant? Because you cannot live this life without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can improve your external life tremendously without the Holy Spirit. You can be a non-Christian and improve your life tremendously. They conduct management seminars in these corporations and companies and get non-Christian management uh, you know, people to teach them techniques on how to improve your work relationships in the company it's external conduct and you can improve your external conduct tremendously and a lot of people when they come to church and listen to a service Sunday morning it's basically it's to many of them it's just like I've got to improve my external conduct I've got to be more thoughtful and I've got to be more sensitive uh, maybe pick up somebody and bring them 
to the service and do some kind act and it's all external, it's just improve your external behavior. And that's all that a lot of people get out of church. And they do improve their external behavior. Well, you might as well go and sit in a management seminar and improve your behavior as well. No, it's, it's an inner life. If an inner life doesn't come, if it's only the, a little improvement in our behavior, we are fooling ourselves if we have entered into the new covenant. It's an inner passion to please God. And that's why I said you can test yourself by asking yourself and you alone can answer that question. Even your wife and your husband cannot answer it. Will there be a change in your direction if you were to transition from earth to heaven tonight? Would there be any change in the motivation and direction of your life, in the things that you're living for? Or would it continue straight in exactly the same way that I want to please God? That's the ambition Paul had. And I believe we can have that ambition, every one of us. It doesn't mean we become hermits or go and live in the forest, no. Jesus pleased God for 30 years. Not as a preacher, not as a full-time Christian worker, but as a working businessman. He was a carpenter. He had to earn his living support his four younger brothers and two sisters and a mother, seven people, eight member family. We had a bigger family than many of us. Eight members in his family. And he had to work and support them. And he faced the same temptations other people faced. The Bible says he was tempted in every point as we are. As a businessman, earning his living, in uprightness. He pleased God as a carpenter. You don't have to be a preacher to please God. It's amazing. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. A testimony that God himself gives concerning Jesus at the end of his 30 years. <clears throat> when Jesus came to John the Baptist for baptism, We read here that, you know, he hadn't done any ministry up until this point. He hadn't preached even in the synagogue in Nazareth. The first time he got up was after this. You read in Luke chapter 4. Never cast out a demon. Never healed a sick person. He, he'd done a lot of good, I'm sure. I'm sure he went around helping poor people and all that. But never, no miracles. No preaching, no miracles, no casting out demons. And at, yet at the end of it, when he goes for baptism, there's a voice from heaven that says in Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's the first man who walked on this earth from the time of Adam about whom God could say, I am pleased with him. At last, there was a man with whom God was well pleased. And that was Jesus. And he hadn't done any miracle. He hadn't preached a sermon. So some of you who are concerned that you don't have a gift of preaching or any public ministry, here's an example for you. You can please God as a mother who never travels the world and probably not, doesn't go much out of your own home. Maybe you have a number of children. And you wonder how can you please God. Do you know that you can please God as much as the Apostle Paul who will sit on the right side and the left side of Jesus I don't know but I will not be surprised if one is an Apostle and the other is some poor mother from some poor country who was faithful in her life equal because you can please God as a mother who never traveled outside your home as much as an apostle who traveled the world building churches. It's not a question of ministry. What we call ministry, Jesus had zero of that at this time. When the father says, I'm well pleased with him. And Jesus spoke about people who had a lot of ministry. In Matthew chapter 7, see the contrast. Matthew 7 and verse 22. 
Many will come to me on the final day and say to me, not one or two, remember, many, probably thousands of preachers, Christian preachers, who will say, Lord, we preached in your name. In the name of Jesus, we preached. We cast out demons in your name. These were people who believed in casting out demons. They were charismatic. And they performed many miracles. Not one or two miracles. Many miracles in Jesus' name. And you think these are the greatest men of God whom the Lord is going to commend. I mean, today when you see people preaching in Jesus' name, casting out demons in Jesus' name, doing miracles or at least pretending to do miracles in Jesus' name, look at all the multitudes who sit and say, Wow, what a man of God. And there'll be so many dumb people who'll say that in that day also. But Jesus turns around and says to them, Get away from me. I never knew you. Matthew 7, 23. You live in sin. What was the problem with their life? He didn't say, Oh, you people are telling lies. You never did any miracles. I mean, they wouldn't dare to tell lies to Jesus in the final day. They wouldn't dare to say they did many miracles if they didn't do it. They did it. They did many miracles in Jesus' name. They had the things which we call ministry. Ministry that was greatly appreciated. But they did not please God. Is that possible? Today when you hear of some man who is preaching to thousands and doing so-called miracles and uh, casting out demons, you say, what a man of God. I don't. I don't. I've read the Bible. I say, I don't know. Whether he's genuine, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying anything against ministry. I preached thousands of sermons. I've cast out demons. I've prayed for the sick and they've been healed. So I'm not against any of these things. I believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I say, not everybody who exercises those gifts are necessarily spiritual people. I can sit in back and say, well, I'm not too sure. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, a little earlier, three verses, three, four verses earlier, verse 16, it is by their fruit you can identify them, not by their gifts. Have you noticed in the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's contrasting the fruit of the Spirit with the gifts of the Spirit? The gifts of the Spirit is what we just read. Casting out demons, preaching, there's nothing against that. Jesus did it. He cast out demons. He preached. He did miracles more than anybody else. But it's by the fruit that we identify a true prophet. Matthew 7 and verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. And just in case you missed it when he said it the first time, he repeats it in verse 20. You will know them by their fruits. It's, more, it's almost the, one of the very few things he repeated in the Sermon on the Mount. A few things he repeated. Don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. Three times. Because he knows that people don't take it seriously. <laughs> they think it's a suggestion. Don't be anxious. It's not a suggestion. There are no suggestions in the Sermon on the Mount. Only commandments. Do not be anxious, do not be anxious, do not be anxious. That is from, you read that in Matthew 6, 25 to 34. And here twice, by their fruit you shall know them. Not by their gifts. Tell me honestly, all of you who are sitting here, please be honest and answer this to yourself before God. Do you admire a man for his gifts or for his fruit? When you look at a man and you hear his ministry and you're impressed, do you try to find out how he's living? Somebody asked me once, Brother Zach, who are the type of preachers you'll invite to preach in your church in CFC in Bangalore? I said, well, I look, these are the things I look for. Number one, I want to see if he's a humble, approachable person. Not one who keeps himself at a distance or who exalts himself or thinks he's superior to me. I don't want any such person. Or who thinks he's superior to anybody in our church. I want to see if he's a humble person, number one. Secondly, I want to see what's his attitude to money. Is he interested in anybody's money? Will he come and preach if he gets zero as a gift? 
Third, I want to know if he's married, something about his children. What are his children like? I'm not asking that they should be preachers, no. Preaching is a gift by their fruits. I want to see if they are godly children. Because your children know you much better than anybody else. You know that. You can fool everybody in your church, but you can't fool your children. They see how you talk to your wife, how you talk to your husband, how you talk to people who come to the house. They see everything. They see you all the time. They know what type of Christian you are. And they'll follow that. If you're a hypocrite, this is what I should be. So I want to know what type of children you've brought up. I say, that's the third thing. And fourth, I said, I want to know what type of co-workers he has. Because a man's, not distant co-workers, but the closest co-workers of a person are a pretty good indication of what he himself is like. When I look at Timothy and the way he lived, I know what Paul is like. Because Paul trained Timothy. And then Paul tells about Timothy, I've got nobody like him who doesn't seek his own, who lives for Christ and seeks the good of others. I say, hey, he got that from Paul. He never saw Jesus, but he saw Paul. We learn a lot by observing the way people live, not just the way the people preach. And Timothy got that from Paul. The man's closest co-workers are a pretty good indication of the man himself. And number five, I'd say, I'd like to see some church that he has planted somewhere. I want to see what type of church it is. Is it a family? Or is it a big organization, like a movie theater? Like people come to hear, to watch a performance on Sunday morning. Or is it a family, where people feel they belong to one another? These are the five things I said I look for. It all relates to the inner life. And it's got nothing to do with preaching ability. And I haven't even mentioned preaching ability in all those things. He may not have much preaching ability, but if he's got these five, I say even if he doesn't have much preaching ability, I'd like to listen to him. He's got something to teach me. Because he's got some values. I'm sorry to say that very few Christians look for that. They look for gift and ability and preaching ability and that's why their own lives remain so shallow. Jesus' life pleased the Father. Now let me show you in contrast to that someone whose life did not please the Father, did not please God. You can see the contrast. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, we just saw someone with whom God said, I am well pleased. I've observed him for 30 years. I've observed his thought life. I've observed his attitudes to people. I've observed the motives with which he lived and worked. And I'm well pleased. And now when you turn to 1 Corinthians 10, we read in verse 5. With most of them, God was not well pleased. The same phrase, well pleased. There it is, I am well pleased at the baptism of Jesus. And here is, I'm not well pleased. And it's very interesting to see the contrast. Who were these people with whom God was not well pleased? The Israelites who came out of Egypt. They were all redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Everyone who came out of the Red Sea were people who had put the blood on the door. So the first thing that symbolizes our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ was there. It says here in verse 2, they were baptized in the sea, which is a picture of water baptism. Did you know that? That when the Israelites, after they put the blood on the door, they went into the Red Sea and out. It was a picture of the water baptism that we take symbolically. And thirdly, they were baptized, verse 2, in the cloud. There was another baptism, a cloud that came down and enveloped them, a picture of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So here were people who were redeemed by the blood, symbolically, baptized in water, 
baptized in the Holy Spirit, but God is not well pleased with them. Now today, most people who are redeemed by the blood, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, think, of course God is well pleased with me. I say, rubbish. I don't, see what it says in chapter 10 verse 1. I don't want you to be unaware, my dear fellow believers, that people who had all these experiences, God was not well pleased with them. And I would like to tell every believer who was born again, baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit, learn from this, that God may not be well pleased with you. And what happened to them, verse 5, and verse 6, has happened as an example for us. And like I said, if we don't pay attention the first time, it's repeated a second time. Verse 11, these things are happened to as an example for us. I like that. The Lord repeating something because he knows that some of us don't pay attention properly the first time. I repeat all the time in my sermons. In fact, I repeat whole sermons. Sometimes I wonder why people keep coming to listening to me. <laughs> I, say, I don't say anything new really. It's like the manna, you know. Every day the manna was the same color, same shape, same taste. <laughs> God is teaching them, my word is like that. But if it comes from heaven, fresh, there's a divine touch in it. But if you keep it at home, it breeds worms in 24 hours. So I see the truth of God is like that. You can hear the truth of God and you think you've understood it, and you keep it in your mind, it breeds worms in 24 hours. But if it has become a part of your life, even if you say the same thing a hundred times, it is fresh every day, like the manna. That's what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does. You can hear a message preached ten times, the same message, anointed of the Holy Spirit is fresh every time, you learn something new every time. But somebody listens to that maybe on YouTube or somewhere and just takes the notes and preaches it, it's got worms in it. Because it's this, the anointing is lacking. So we see here that these people had all these experiences. God was not well pleased with them. But what did God do for them? God did the greatest miracles for them that are written in the entire Bible. Is there any greater miracle than 600,000 men plus many other women and children, 2 million people, getting food from heaven every day. I mean, if that happened for one day, it would be a miracle. It happened every day for 40 years. I've never heard in the Bible of anyone having such a group of people having so many miracles. Even Jesus didn't do miracles for 2 million people like that every day. 40 years. Food from heaven, water from the rock. No sickness. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, there was not one lame person among them. Imagine if there were a few lame people there. How would they walk in the wilderness? And it says their sandals never wore out, their clothes never wore out. Imagine wearing the same shirt and pant for 40 years and the same pair of shoes. It's amazing the miracles that took place. And at the end of it, God was not well pleased with them. What do you learn from that? God can answer your prayers do miracles for you, it does not mean that he is well pleased with you. If you've learned that, you've learned what is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What did we see in Matthew chapter 3? A man, Jesus, who never did any miracles, who never got any manna from heaven in his 30 years, who never got a water from a rock in 30 years, whose clothes wore out, he had to change his clothes many times in 30 years, whose sandals wore out in 30 years, but God is well pleased with him. And here is a group of people in 1 Corinthians 10 who had the most fantastic miracles in all these areas. God was not well pleased with them. What do we learn from this? Some people think God answered my prayer, therefore he's well pleased with me. He is not. It's an inner life that Jesus had. He was tempted, but he never sinned. Hebrews 4, 15. That's the one thing we know about his 30 years. He was tempted, but he never sinned. That is what made the, Jesus well-pleasing to the Father. 
what shall we say? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will impress these truths deeply in our hearts, not just that we understand these in our minds and the thing disappears. They'll be so deeply imprinted in our hearts that they'll change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.